the start, I really find this such an emotional moment, and I'm terribly nervous. So, um, uh, bear with me. Um, well, good evening, friends and colleagues, and um, I would like to thank everyone for being here, particularly my colleagues at the UHI, who, in a way, the institution provided me with a home for my research, which has gone on for more decades than I care to remember. Companions, lots of them here in the room today, but I also know there are a number on the VC, on the VC link as well. And friends, for your presence in person or virtually, I really feel honored to address you today. I couldn't have done my work without the involvement of many people who gave their time freely and were willing to share their experiences in the numerous projects I have undertaken during my time as a researcher. I'm indebted to them, and it is to them that I owe much of my learning journey. My parents, as immigrants, refugees, who worked hard to make a good immigrant out of me, I had a lucky break. In my first job in the Highlands, um, I owe it to a going man, a professional who worked in education, whom I actually never met to meet. But he unknowingly opened the path to my, my first employment, uh, which was not in education, as being of the right minority. Being gone chimed really well with the organization's idea of a good employee fit for a professional job. That was lucky. However, performing the good immigrant ideal employee has its challenges, particularly in rural areas. And especially if one chooses not to play the game in the way one is expected to. But it has been an interesting journey. Finally, and most importantly, thank you to my family and the loves of my life. Alistair, Paul, and Cathal were there, who have challenged my ways of thinking, of looking at life and living life, and from whom I continue to learn so much. They've also had to live with my obsessional interests and at times very strong views. But without his love and support, I would not have survived in the Highlands. I would have not carried on the here. So on to my um, focus today and some of the background to how um, I've come to what I want to talk today. Um, some of you may have heard um, some of my some of these things uh, because I've been my thoughts have been really changing and evolving, which, which is as it should be, over the last few years. Um, I had a stream of projects, which were a, 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 a number of very intensive years of doing field work, and then I began to feel quite unhappy with some of the things I was doing. And I decided I needed to take a step back. And, um, and it's been an interesting learning journey. And one of the things that I brought things, um, uh, sort of started to make me think differently was I was researching for a book that's, that was published by Dunedin Press, which is called International Migrants and Wellbeing. And I, and I began, it was at the time when there was this huge panic in Europe about being invaded by refugees and immigrants. And it was a, key moment for me to start rethinking about what I was doing. So my aim today is to take you through sort of a, um, it's a bit self-indulgent probably, but a journey by providing a reflective account, which at its core, I would like to highlight three related points. Um, this is a test of how this works. Okay, so 
So uh, I want to highlight three points, and uh, hopefully they will make sense to you, because I've been living these things in my, in, with them in my head for a, for a while. So we are all implicated in mobility, migration, one way or the other. You know, we have this sort of discussion in, in, in when you could have it in my opinion, I suppose, whether mobility is the right word to use or is migration a better word to use. And, and I won't go into that, but that's a whole kind of discussion in itself. And some people choose to use the word mobility because they feel it frees it from the stigmatization of migrants and migration. And there's sort of pros and cons with that. Um, the, other, the other point I would like to make is migration is not an isolated phenomenon. It is contingent and um, <coughs> shaped by political, economic, social, and environmental conditions in the context of dynamic geopolitical and historical conditions. And I think that's really important. Because much of the research that certainly um, uh, that one sees when there's an explosion, implosion of research on migration, it's the moment, is very much focused on issues such as labor migration, integration debates, very much from a northern perspective. And I, I want to start addressing those issues. And, um, you know, the sort of binaries, you know, a migrant is at the moment, more or less conflated with being an international migrant. Internal migrants are completely absent from this debate. And there are many other binaries of North, South, if you like, and I'm going to use some of them, and I feel terribly uncomfortable with it, but um, uh, I'll come back to that. And, and, you know, and binaries are problematic because they see things as black and white, but they can also be lines that hold the edge and can also be those provide those in-between spaces to um, challenge, experiment, transform normative ways of thinking, doing, and being. And you know, I'm particularly in my own uh, particularly focused on my own work within the UHI, I have used these liminal spaces in a way to my advantage by creating a niche by obsessively following something, sometimes at the cost of my um, my family having to bear the costs of it. So I'm interested in, in that kind of notion of lines moving and edges and, you know, and how we use that as a way of moving debates forward. Of course, there are many issues that one could address, um, you know, uh, in migration. The three that I intend to start focusing on, fo focusing on are a starting point. And um, these insights and uh, the sorts of issue, um, points I'm going to make today are based on my own experience as a researcher, reflecting on some of the work I've been doing, and that of many others undertaken in this field, sociologists as well as others. Um, it's also... Um, been, uh, draws on my engagement with and learning from perspectives beyond the North and the many dialogues and conversations I've had with colleagues, early career researchers, doctoral, postdoc researchers I've worked with in the Highlands and the UK, but also importantly outside the UK. The three who need a special mention tonight for me are Belinda Leach, who's a professor of gender studies at the University of Guelph. She and I are collaborating on some interesting work which came out of Belinda's challenge to me about why, why I was reading on a theme of migration for a Canadian project, which is a seven-year project, and we were only talking about international migration. She's saying, why do we do this? And it, it set up a conversation and a project that's ongoing between us. Um, and uh, and I, I find that to be very helpful. Linamar Campos Flores, a doctoral student and researcher who I worked with for over four years, who opened my eyes to the issues around emotional geography, something I knew very little about, which, which was lovely, where she is doing a piece of work following migrant, Mexican migrants in Canada and in Mexico, looking at families, but looking at the emotions of she, She's originally Mexican, but lives in Canada. Um, and Donald McLeod, who I know is not sure, but he's a dear friend with whom I've worked with for many years on issues related to poverty amongst uh, other projects in the Highlands. And, um, and he has been a good companion to me all through my work on, particularly in the context of Highland 
issues. I would also like to weave into my talk something of my own migration and biography and sort of journey a little bit. So before I proceed, some of the language I use today, which is North, South, migrant mobilities, I know is deeply problematic, homogenizing, and highly contested. And there's masses of literature on it which I can't really address. The fact that I don't address these today does not in any way mean I don't take the issue of language and categorizations of the diversities within and across categories seriously. It is, um, it's because, just a lack of time, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end if, uh, if people want me to talk about these. It's also unusual for me not to focus on rural and the highlands and islands in particular. I can't think of when I would have done that. But I hope you will see that what I have to say today has a strong resonance with the region and comes from having lived and worked here in the Highlands and elsewhere in Scotland as a whole for 40 plus years. It scares me to think that I've been in Scotland for that much longer than I lived, lived anywhere else. So by focusing on rural migrants and minority ethnic groups in my own research, I have been aware of the dangers of reinforcing reductionist notions of, for example, rural, urban, international, national, host, host countries, destination countries, all these sorts of dualities that one works with. My concerns about reinforcing the otherness, particular individuals and groups that have been the focus of my research have become stronger as time has passed. A lack of research on those individual groups who feel migrants, minority ethnic groups are a threat to their identities and ways of life has, a, a, in other words, we, we focus on migrants, but we don't focus on local communities and their views. And I find that an interesting dynamic, and it's troubled me. It troubled me from the very beginning, but somehow it was very difficult to get research funding to, to look at the other side of what was happening in uh, 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 the other side of the community. And I what I find is that it has resulted in research where every aspect of migrants' lives in the destination countries are laid bare and subject to what sometimes feels like the voyeuristic gaze of researchers where migrant ident identities are privileged over and above all else. Migrants are not just migrants. They have other identities as well. And, and I feel very deeply troubled by the continuation of this kind of research. For some reason, it's very difficult to get research that actually explores the into perspectives. I have also experienced the emotional and moral dilemmas of being an inside researcher, which presents both opportunities and challenges, but which, will, which I will not be addressing today in, in, in any way. So let me begin by outlining my, my migration journey. And I'm sure everybody, I know that when I speak to people, everybody has an interesting story. I'm a first generation migrant to the UK, born in Uganda to parents who were born in Portu Portuguese Goa in the south of India. And they migrated to East Africa via Bombay in the 1940s as Portuguese citizens. They subse subsequently acquired British citizenship and lived in East Africa until the early 70s when they arrived in the UK as refugees from Uganda, albeit with my father having a job to come to in Scotland as he had Scottish friends he had met in Uganda in the course of his work. My father lived in various parts of East Africa before settling in Uganda. My family made several trips to other parts of East Africa and to Goa by sea, including a short stint of return migration in the midst of 1960s that did not quite work out. And so they decided to return to Uganda with three of my siblings, leaving me in Goa with a grand grandmother in, at the age of seven years old. I was educated in a convent until I was 18 of eight years of age when I joined them in Scotland. My parents and two of my siblings moved from Edinburgh to London around four years later. As you may have noted from this description, I was a child of serial movers across and within three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, involving rural to urban, to rural to urban, and so on, many different permutations of movement, whilst also tra traversing several categorizations and legal statuses. 
My father migrated for work, so in other words, he was a labor migrant. My mother joined him. They had to leave Uganda without any assets and came to the UK as refugees, although they did have British citizenship. I was what um, sociologists call, and I've been at meetings when sociologists call people like myself a left behind child. Didn't think that was a very nice term if you're at the, at the receiving end of someone's research. Changing citizenship status for me involved being Portuguese at birth, then British, and at 18 years of age became stateless, or what was described as a British protected person. Uh, that was because um, I hadn't, I had traveled on my parents' passport and then hadn't traveled out of India until I was 18. And, and because I came from um, an Asian family and I was 18 years of age, of course the immigration authorities treated me very suspiciously and my parents had a huge problem getting me into this country. A few years later, I acquired British citizenship in my own right and I've recently acquired even the status of overseas citizen of India, although I've never been an Indian citizen, as India, like many other countries, tries to encourage the Indian diaspora to return and invest in India. As, be as Goa became incorporated into India in 1961, it changed with the substantial waves of migrants from the hippies, um, which I remember as a child growing up in Goa in the 1960s, <coughs> to people from other states in India, lifestyle migrants and health tourists. Um, I have a photograph, not a very terribly good photographer, but uh, you might notice Russian fly flags mainly, it's not terribly good, and British flags. So this is Goa, and um, you know, it's an interesting place because you don't see any Goans about. And the, the only people that you see are uh, possibly Nepalese and some Goan people in the back somewhere cooking or off, uh, or, and, and um, sort of providing drinks uh, for people. So, um, so, you know, this is one facet of migration where we have lifestyle migrants and health tourists from Europe and Russia, actually. I mean, you know, Russia is interesting. They are traveling in many places, but India had a very close relationship to Russia, you know close trade relationship rather than the US for me for before in the, uh, before the current regime. I mean when Lindy Gandhi was in power. So I just want you to hold on to you know the fact that we have British, Russian, there's something about the, the way in which these migrations happen. <coughs> so at the at the same time as we have um, you know and of course local people feel that their place has changed. They're not being racist towards um, the British or the Russians by saying it, it has changed for them. They cannot see themselves mirrored in the environment that they're in. And I think that's an important issue to, to sort of bear in mind when we think about migrants and migration. Whilst those of Goan origin continue to leave for the Middle East, Europe and the States and the Goan diaspora across the world continue to maintain aspects of their culture and language and their transnational ties and organize themselves in different ways. Something that's applauded, by the way, for, of the Scottish diaspora in Scotland, but we seem to forget that, that you know, uh, we can do this in, in, in the North, but somehow when people of other countries, other cultures do it, that this is somehow them clinging to their culture. And I, I find these discourses very troubling. So one of the questions for me when I was thinking of binaries was how do we capture these permeable, evolving categorizations? I might seem unusual, but I'm, I'm not. Um, and the different intersecting identities. I mean, the fact that I am of, I'm of uh, Goan origin, that I've got British citizenship, I'm a woman that has issues around the caste system in India, all these things are part of my identity. I'm not one thing, and nor are you all there. I bet you're not one thing. So why do we constantly essentialize migrant <coughs> identities? I mean, I'm really puzzled by this. Why is it? Um, so how do we come to understand these binaries between these different categories? What methods do we need to use to explore these issues? Whose voices should be represented? Whose knowledge counts? 
How do we develop a more situated understanding of migrants and migrants' lives, including their emotions, the attachment to place, the here and there and the in-between, in ways that resist reinforcing dualities? Life does not begin and end when one arrives in the North. And in the North, I mean the rich countries of the global North. Migration is a process that involves multiple journeys across many places, embedded in dynamic social relationships across and within nation states. So the lives of migrants cannot be understood by bracketing it, bracketing it and freezing it in one point and place and time, which is what much of the research on migration tends to do. Migrants don't leave their lives, experiences, and cultures and the borders they are arriving at, leaving, returning to. Who they are at any one point in time is an accumulation of their life experiences. They've had lives before. Do we care to find out what they were in our research? A, f a point that um, I came to, um, as I was sort of starting to explore this issue, I, I rediscovered or discovered for the first time, shamefully, the work of um, Syed, who was of, of French, Algerian origin of sociologists whose work was translated in 2004 called The Suffering of the Emigrant. And um, there he, he talks about the ways in which um, we forget that an, an immigrant is also an emigrant. They've arrived somewhere, but they've actually left a place might be voluntarily, or they might be forcibly torn away from a place. And uh, I'll leave you to read it for a second. So on the one hand, as he argues, the behavior and norms of the immigrant are seen as dysfunctional in the context of the norms of the whole society. And on the other hand, their cultural heritage are seen as breaks or obstacles in adopting in their new social environment. And you know, in my research, I saw this happening when I remember, it wouldn't happen now, when um, you know, a teacher sort of would encourage uh, a French speaker to keep their language. But of course, if you are Pakistani origin or whatever, they would say, oh no, you know, don't speak to them in English at all. And, uh, you know, and that um, is something that I, I think wouldn't happen now. But these are the sorts of issues. So there was a hierarchy of, la of language where it was okay to bring up your child teaching Japanese even, because I remember there were Japanese children in the schools here, and I did some research around at that time when uh, I think the Japanese were buying up some of the, uh, the story businesses and they had children in the schools. And you know, this, that was seen as okay, so you, know, you could speak Japanese, it came from a sort of developed country or whatever, but if you came from Pakistan or Africa, you were discouraged as a parent uh, to, um, in, uh, to speak in your own language because it was felt that that would be a barrier to them learning English properly, okay? So, um, and to some extent, um, what this points to as well is the constant obsession with integration debates where the focus is on constantly trying to be, I'm not saying that learning English is not important and so on, far be it, I'm not saying any of that, but you know, even today in the Highlands, and I, I'm aware of this uh, because people often co contact me and speak to me about this, it is difficult for a child whose who's, um, religion or festivals might be different to get time off school to celebrate their, 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 their particular festival. One day of school is not going to actually damage their education. This is the culture that we're living in. And I think that this is really important. So I think, you know, the, I, I think the idea is really important that an immigrant and an immigrant are two sides of the same coin. People have left somewhere, they have life somewhere else, and they come here and they have life here. I mean, frankly, the people that left here took their cultures with them and continue to keep their cultures there. So, you know, what is it that why is it that we have this obsession about integrating people into what social norms are we talking about? You know, what are what are the norms here? I find it difficult to, to, to 
to each other out. So, um, science and science and, emph um, and emphasis resonate with many other academics. There are, the, there's a, there are people such as Abderai, Glick um, Schiller, who looks at transnational relationships and belonging and so on. So on. And the work of post-colonial writers such as um, Said, um, uh, Franz Fanon, and so on, who have sought to go beyond the enduring and reductive discourses located in colonial relationships to highlight the different <coughs> power ge geometries that exist, you know, the hierarchies that I mentioned, which is it's okay to have this language, but not that. Social location, your social class. Um, when you arrive, geograph ge geographical areas you've arrived from, within, these are all the sorts of things that migrants' lives are located in. The obsessive focus on labor migration, integration and privileging of the experiences of migrations, migrants, sorry, in destination countries, with some exceptions, not only re reinforces hegemonic and homogenizing discourses of migrants, but also denies their multiple positionalities associated with gender, social class, ethnicity, and so on, as they negotiate their lives and um, live here and there, because they don't have to just live here. They can also maintain their relationships with many people elsewhere. The, the next uh, uh, sort of point that I wanted to make was around we are all implicated in migration in, in ways that are explicit and in ways that are implicit. You know, we don't have to be mobile to be implicated in migration. Um, migration is embodied in the services we consume, the food we eat, strawberries, whatever it is that we want to eat all the year round are produced in greenhouses, I'll come to that in a minute, but which uh, where there are migrants working, illegal migrants in some cases. Oranges and Sic Sicilian oranges. Um, a young Italian academic once said, well, if you eat Sicilian oranges, you're eating blood. Slave labor. We're all implicated in different ways. So we live in a hypermobile world of uh, people, goods, services on the move. Uh, mobility is not something out there. It's all of us involved in it, myself included. <coughs> but it, and it takes many forms. However, as I always like this quote from Stuart Hall, he's a sociologist, when he talks about how we're all migrants, we travel around, especially academics are very good at going to conferences and so on, across borders and airplanes, to mobile phones in the video conference link today. But as the border guard reminded me, we're not all equally migrants. Some are permitted more access than the others. And as we know, borders do count for most people, but may not count if one is wealthy, you can buy citizenship anywhere. Uh, if you're of a particular class, or possibly gender, or race, amongst other social markers. So it isn't an to everyone. The demonizing and dehumanizing discourses on international migrants as an undifferentiated masses all around us, whether it is EU citizens in the UK or what the EU describes as third country national refugees across EU member states. Some of the very countries where their own citizens, some of whom have lived in the UK for most of their lives, are, are encountering othering processes in the context of Brexit. Clearly, who is a migrant is not fixed. It can change in the context of changing geopolitics, as we see now, and in particular historical contexts. So, whilst international migration to Europe and, uh, and to the USA is significant, I mean, uh, you know, the numbers are large, discourse of a mass exodus of people all ending up in the global north is factually inaccurate and not correct. Um, I mean, I've looked at these statistics over a period of time, and I keep coming back to these. And the mid-2019 uh, population data published by the UN reinforces this. 
International migrants make up 3.5% of the global population, which is estimated at 7.7 .7 billion. I mean, you have, yeah, you have to be careful with these statistics as well. Because, uh, for example, return migrants are not logged into the system. And, was, and you know, there are huge problems with the data. So, but what comes out of the stats, whatever way you look at it, is the majority of people do not leave their countries of origin. They choose to stay. I'm not arguing against my issue, but I think that's an important point. So the estimated of uh, number of internal migrants in countries is larger, is 762 million, and, and, and happen on a vast scale in places like India, China, and so on. urban to rural, rural, well, rural to urban mainly. So um, it, was, it was interesting looking at Syed's um, quote here because you know, he was writing at a particular time, and he was writing at a time where much of the, uh, he was writing about France mainly, um, and much of the migration were men as well, so a lot of kind of talking about the he in the migrants, which is not the case anymore. Contemporary migratory movements from the countries of the underdeveloped world, a word I wouldn't use, countries where rural and peasant populations are in the majority, uh, towards the countries of the developed world, countries in which urban and industrial civilization is dominant, are in a way similar to the international migration of old, where people moved from, I suppose, cities um, in places like Britain, France, and so on, uh, to urban areas. And, you know, what, he, what he's, the point he's trying to make here is basically that um, really when we're looking at migration, looking at migration with, with the national frame in mind with the, within the nation state is not always helpful. Looking at the way the drivers of migration, if you look at drivers of migration in terms of internal, internal migration and international migration, you might find that there are similarities. And using a national context, and he goes on to talk about how people are in a national frame of mind when they think about international migrants. But what he says is, and you know, this is the sorts of things that I'm exploring at the moment, what happens if you take out the national and focus on looking at the link between local to local rather than the, the without the nation state in mind? And I think, you know, I'm on a journey. It's a very challenging thing to do. It's a very challenging piece of research to try and execute. Sort of begs the question of how one does it, and this is what we're working through at the moment. But I, I think, I, and I'll keep coming back to beyond the nation state, not because I do think it is unimportant. I do think it is important, but there are issues that we need to address. So one of the things around the international migrants is that um, most of the international migrants stay in the same region or continent from which they come from. So there's much more migration between people, uh, between in Asian countries, between Asian countries, if you like, than people coming from Asia into Europe. That's the point. Okay? So even when, because migration is defined as someone not, not born in a particular nation state, that's how the UN defines it. So someone not born in the country where they are, where they live, in, in the nation state where they live, is international. Okay? And this is another nightmare, by the way, people use different uh, definitions for migrants. So most people tend to migrate from, say, from, I don't know, Sri Lanka, or from Nepal to India than they would to Europe and, and, and the US. Okay? Uh, or, or wherever. And uh, th there's been some re really interesting research recently on Africa, where, which has been highlighted because of the focus on uh, the sub Saharan African refugees and some arriving and the invasions of Africans that were led to. So, Asmita Pashotan, who's, um, she's uh, of South African origin. Um, and uh, someone that um, is, uh, is part of, uh, has been an, in, uh, is an independent and development expert, but also an attorney of the High Court of South Africa argues that behind the recent EU-Africa political and multilateral negotiations, the prevailing ideas um, <coughs> about, mass ex about the mass exodus of Africans and, and the view that they are poor, uneducated, or semi-skilled are not accurate. She notes, 
statistics hardly correlate with the images portrayed in the European media of migrants arriving on European shores or requiring rescue from the Mediterranean Sea. In fact, Africa is the least migratory region in the world. The majority of African migrant migration occurs, occurs within the continent and specifically intra-regional. And more international migrants live within Africa than outside Africa. And um, looking at the, those, the African country that receives the most African, the, the African migrants are South Africa, followed by Cote d'Ivoire, the Boer, and, and Nigeria, while Kenya, Ethiopia, and South, Southern Sudan host the largest refugees. So they're not all banging on the doors of, or the borders, which are now in Libya and Turkey to come to Europe. Gerda Heck, a sociologist in an article for Global Dialogue, which has just been published by the International Sociological Association, notes that although Europe is not irrelevant, when discussing migration from Africa, it certainly does not merit the central place it occupies in the popular discourses and academic work, work which frame it, which frame African mobilities. Not all of those who leave the African <coughs> continent, even those that do, do not end up in Europe. In fact, communities can be found in the Gulf states and increasingly in Latin America, Asia, China, Guangzhou, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and so on. So I think that it's important to put these things into perspective. So despite the, the UN evidence, which shows that international migration is, is, uh, is by by far not the largest percentage of people migrating. And despite the fact that most people from the southern region stay within their regions, the South continues to remain invisible as a, except as an exporter of people to the north, to, to the north, described as invasions, swarms, floods, and so on. But Saskia Sassen, a sociologist who I admire greatly because she does some brilliant work, argues that migration does not happen. It might seem self-evident, but we seem to forget it. They are produced, and migrations do not involve just any possible combination of countries. They're countries with whom countries in Europe or elsewhere have particular links, both have had particular links and continue to have particular links. They are patterned and produced. International migrants don't just happen. They are embedded in particular historical, uh, in specific historical phases, but I would also in particular geopolitics. And I think the important thing is this notion of invasion and the terms that we use or migration as a problem often that has to be solved, frames the debate and prevents us from developing a more systematic and nuanced understanding of how migration is systemic and is structurally produced within the systems that are around us and are probably invisible, and I'll come to that. So the North is not a passive victim of so-called invasion of migrants as is portrayed. The centralized and racialized throats of the migrant as worker, revived for job, taking jobs away from locals or driving wages down, or defended on utilitarian grounds, for example, as essential to countering the impact of demographic trends associated with shrinking populations in the North and as good workers, good citizens, serve in their own different ways, not only to reinforce the crisis na narratives of the North, and promote an instrumental view of migrants, but also renders invisible the active involvement and the role of the North in structuring migra migratory trends and the diverse mobilities of people and capital from the North to the South. It actually ignores North to South uh, migration. And it's interesting because uh, recent documents by the UN and the International Organization of Migration increasingly tries to move beyond the north south and tries to demonstrate that migrant migration pa uh, patterns are very diverse. 
and I, I don't know, I, I tried to lighten it up in some pictures, but, but you might, uh, someone here, Patricia might guess where they are. Um, uh, this was, uh, this is in, a, a site, yeah, um, in southwest of Spain, where you have northerners spending their, their whole um, um, six months or whatever of the year wandering from place to place, uh, free by the way, um, in a place that's a national park, leaving their rubbish behind, not paying any local taxes or anything. Are they migrants? Beside those big uh, vans and their homes, virtually, you have these greenhouses where people are working, migrants are working in hermetically sealed greenhouses to produce cucumbers or whatever it is for the northern European market. Also <coughs> owned by Dutch, German companies, um, uh, m many of them, um, and um, 50 degrees centigrade work conditions there, um, using people who live in those conditions there. And I, I, I did that, uh, we got this photograph and it was incredibly nerve-wracking to get it because they had dogs, um, you know, it, it felt like a police state, this particular place, and, and the greenhouses just went for miles and miles and miles. And the, the violence to the environment was just astounding. It was just shocking. So we're not only sort of expelling people and so on by our consumption habits, but we're also expelling flora, fauna, we're destroying the environment in front. So that's why I think migration is not an issue that has to be understood on its own. It's part of a sy systemic issue that we need to get at. It's also, I mean, there's m m a lot of research, and I can't go into it, that shows that migration patterns are just very diverse. Um, but I want to, uh, you know, so that we don't essentialize things. So there is site-site migration. Um, uh, and, and migrants in the site, as well as indigenous groups, as we know, are objects of stigmatization, exploitation, and discrimination processes, similar to what a lot of research identifies as international migrants experiencing in northern countries. So that um, Pashotam, who is the South African uh, independent development expert, notes that although the African Union has formulated promising and progressive migration policies that clearly re recognize migration as a tool for development, African countries are often themselves unwelcoming of African migrants. So one can point to, for example, the treatment of Nigerians in South Africa, the trafficking and use of slave labor in the Thai fishing industry. Uh, to provide the tiger prawns and other exotic fish for consumption. The extensive use of Nepalese workers and uh, uh, Nepalese and other workers from territories under direct Indian rule in the tourist industry in India. The lives of domestic workers in the Middle East. The forced use of Uyghurs in China to, to in, um, implicated in cotton yarn um, supply chain chains used by companies such as Gap and HMM, HM and M, and so on. That's an interesting example of internal migration. So, you know, these things somehow need to connect up. You know, it doesn't just happen in the north, it happens in the south. So how do we move beyond those binaries as well, the north side? If our, you know, for me it feels that uh, those aspects, at the moment when I look at the kind of the research that one that I'm familiar um, with and uh, looking at, one feels at times that the aspects of the global migration system that don't fit into sort of the normative discourse of migrant invasions from the south to the north have tended to be left to activists and human rights organizations to highlight and are rendered somewhat invisible in the academic literature of migration as we navel gaze over whether migrants are integrated or not into our society. The selective focus on, on, on some aspects of uh, migration and the erasure of others from our view, but some of it because it's invisible, we don't have to move anywhere, we just have to consume something and it involves exploitation or migrant labor, 
It could be argued is one of the consequences of failing migration and mobilities within, again, the context of particular nation states and geopolitical uh, paradox underpinned by colonial relationships. I'm not arguing that nation states are unimportant, but rather that it might be helpful in some instances to widen our frame of thinking and doing research beyond the nation state and the north by undertaking more comparative research at different scales, as well as by taking the long view to, con to conceptualize the present, a historical perspective. This may help to uncover some of the deeper dynamics and shape migration discourses with a view to gaining a better understanding of the similarities and, and differences, as well as the specifics associated with different mobile bodies as they crisscross different lines, borders, within and across national spaces, as well as across time. So now, hopefully, come to the point about we are all migrants. What, what's that about? Um, so the notion that we are all migrants um, is not a call to flatten differences and experiences of different types of migration in the North and South, but to call attention to the underlying systemic conditions that affects those described as migrants and, as, and those who are non-migrants in different ways. We Are All Migrants um, comes from um, one of my other favorite books that I discovered. Um, he's an anthropologist from uh, Gregory Feldman uh, and his title of the book, which was published in 2015, in which he goes on, uh, in which he calls We Are All Migrants, which he got, goes on to state that in the contemporary world, people globally are facing common conditions of existence, which he describes as migranthood, and includes ruthlessness, uncertainty, being disempowered, and atomized lives. He argues that by insisting that the migrant is fundamentally different from the citizen, we obscure their shared conditions, undermining collective political agency in the process. So, a quota, which I quote at length, but you know, basically saying uh, migrants experience the same eggs and flows and so on, um, and and um, so so there are others, and Saskia Sassen, come back to to her work again, a sociologist has sought to demonstrate that migration cannot be understood as, a merely, as merely an aggregation of individual decisions, often promoted by explanations such as poverty, that emphasize the motivation of migrants and refugees as in being in search of a better life. These are easy things in some ways, because we can, you know, we can develop sympathy and feel sorry for people without dealing with the issues of power that actually have led to those impoverished people in those particular regions. It's a good way for us to bypass those deep sort of underlying inequalities that we have to deal with. For, for Sassen, international migration stands at the intersection of a number of economic and ge geographical processes that link the countries invoked, you know, whether it's Britain receiving uh, migrants from Hong Kong, from uh, India, Pakistan, or whatever, they pass connections. They're not simply an outcome of individuals in search of better opportunities. Part of the problem is recognizing <coughs> why, how, why, and when governments, economic actors, media, and populations at large in highly developed countries participate in immigration processes. And She argues that it, it's not good enough to understand migration as an aggregation of individuals and households. It's a good, rational, it fits into the rational economic models that we like to promote. But it doesn't actually make sense from a migration point of view, and indeed from looking at it uh, from a broader perspective. She argues that migration has to be understood as systemic embedded in unequal global economic, social, political, and environmental relationships, and then changing geopolitical and historical conditions, which are 
often absent in the discussions about migration that I would have. Lack of time makes, me makes it difficult to explain the range of issues in which migration is implicated. Food is one. But I just wanted to touch on land grabs, because that's been receiving recent attention, to briefly, and I can only do that briefly, to illustrate the web of potential interconnections which, um, with, with, uh, with migration, which hardly I ever explored. In fact, I'm not going to explore that. So land grab is a, is a catch-all phrase used to describe and analyze global, transnational, but also national appropriation of land to promote development. It's a, it's, a lot of it focuses on the foreign acquisition of land in countries like Africa, India, and so on. With, with a few exceptions, and mostly operating in different fields of study, for example, there's some literature on domestic land grabbing in China, at least one or two articles that I've come across, probably a lot in Mandarin, maybe. The Journal of Peasant Studies have, have also published articles on various aspects of land grabbing with passing references to population displacement. And there is a whole body of literature on land grabbing which is related to indigenous groups, which is quite separate from all of this. However, it is very difficult to cover academic literature on the intersections between land grabbing and migration trends in the field of migration studies themselves. And the voices of these displaced in the context are noticeable by the absence, at least in the academic literature published in English. Land grabbing experienced a fundamental shift in 2000, since 2006. It, and experienced an increase in volume and geographical spread following the acquisitions of land from 2006 to 2011. 200 million hectares of land were estimated to have been acquired by foreign governments. I'm sure that's an underestimation. Corporations and civil society players. The, fa the factors identified as being significant in land grabs involve a growing demand for industrial crops, such as uh, soya and so on but also particularly palm oil, palm for biofuels, and for food crops as well, for export to ensure a reliable supply, food chain supply, a cheap, affordable food chain supply, primarily to the global north, and increasingly to countries like India and China as well. Uh, so land grabs, another reason for buying them as are, as are sites of ecosystem services, a word I absolutely detest, I have to say, and as um, mineral reserves, so for resource extraction. Land is also being bought as a desirable investment, just to be there in case there, there comes a time when it's for speculative reasons. In the event of food price hikes and so on, then it could be sold for a huge profit. <coughs> so um, it's very difficult to get as you can imagine, data on land grabs. I mean, how do you even begin to find it? There is an organization called Land Matrix that provides an interactive website where it try, it's an open source um, program where people can go and look at different regions and try and calculate things. And I just draw on the work of Sasson on this. So there is a north south pattern for foreign ownership, which is 30% of investors based in Europe. There's also an emerging site site dynamic. So 22 of the investors are based in the Middle East. 20% are Asian, China, India, for example. I know that India has huge interests in Ethiopia. You know, why on earth there? No idea. 10% um, are from so the African countries are the least, and approximately 18% of investors are located in Brazil, Australia, and the US. And this is probably an underestimation, and, and the data is very obscure. So, um, and Africa has the highest concentration of foreign ownership of land, the place where people are leaving in droves, if you like, but not really in droves, as the data shows us. Over 3.1 billion people worldwide, mostly in the south, are depending on land for their livelihoods. Land is typically either state-owned or customary land, where legal titles, etc., may not exist or not easily access. Natural resources such as water, forests, farming, and grazing lands are often used and managed 
communally, communally under Castilian laws. However, state actors and corporations, sometimes with the collusion of traditional leaders, have been successful in land acquisition by various means. In addition, in addition to fundamentally changing the local communities, as you can imagine, and diminishing the authority of states over their own territories, probably owned by corporations, uh, are being, they are being resisted. The consequences, though, are many. They include mass expulsions of well, flora, fauna, animal life, resulting in destruction of the environment and biosphere, People who lived off the land and are now the landless populations migrating to are now the landless migration uh, populations migrating to urban areas, but also crossing national borders. Because it's well known that people tend to go from rural to urban to international, and you know we rarely understand that migration process. We seem to kind of have an amnesia about the fact that they might have had several migrations before they arrived in somewhere, somewhere like Europe or whatever. So land grabbing is also being initiated by national governments within a country to promote development. Examples of these are evident in a number of countries, China, India, Brazil, and so on. For those that remain, increased levels of poverty, starvation, and increase in suicides, for example, I know that's been reported in India among small farmers, murders and killings of those who resist through the deployment of um, a local militia or the military, the state military. The little, the little evidence that does exist, because it's, it's not very researched as far as I could see, is that it certainly does not result in poverty reduction, which is promoted by those who facilitate such land grabbing practices. The role of agencies such as the World Bank and trade negotiations involving agencies of, such as the World Trade Organization are fundamental in promoting and facilitating land grabbing. And they do this through um, mechanisms such as providing technical advice and advisory services to, to governments, aid condi conditionality, and regulatory reforms to attract pri foreign private investment for economic development. The threat of sa sanctions in trade negotiations conducted with Africa, for example, by the EU at the moment, uh, and the subsidization of farmers by the EU and the USA are very are prime examples of promoting free trade in the rest of the world while also not practicing it themselves. So land grabbing goes in with things such as trade negotiations. So we have to look at these as connected up. Um, and uh, South African trade expert, um, uh, trade uh, um, expert observes, has observed recently that as a result of such negotiations in Africa, you know, this is really current, this is happening on an ongoing basis where the EU are becoming huge pressure on Africa to sign up agreements um, uh, related to, for example, issues around migration and so on, um, and um, uh, a conditionality, even, even DFID are involved in some of these, uh, these um, aspects of uh, conditionality, you know, funding given give to Africa and so on, on the condition that they allow foreign transactions, the buying of land and so on. And what he observes is that as a result um, of these land grabbing deals, African farmers are less able to compete. They destroy their livelihoods. It causes mass patterns of migration. And you know that there are consequences in terms of issues of migration, asylum seekers, and so, so forth. These consequences can be replicated around the world, and yet these are uh, erased from the academic discourses and research on migration that we conduct. Clearly, migration is not an isolated phenomenon which can be solely addressed by migration policies. It is deeply entrenched in dynamics and changing geopolitics, current economic models, historical environment, cultural and social context. Migration is closely associated with the intensification and perpetuating of the unequal distribution of social, political and economic rights globally, which are manifested in various ways within and between nation states. These consequences of these growing inequalities are felt and experienced in local communities and goes beyond legal definitions of migrants and more migrants, as both are affected by deregulated labor market, erosion of their human rights, precarious conditions of employment and living, lack of access to nourishing food, separation from friends and families, changing and unfamiliar neighborhoods and surrounds. 
Marta, it's, um, as I was doing this, there was an interesting program on radio, actually, but I also found an article by someone called Marta Vida, who's a writer in the New Internationalist, and she recounts the story of an 85-year-old uh, woman in Oporto, this is in a city, uh, where um, uh, landlords are, being, are invict, uh, evicting tenants because they want to transform their apartments into short-term rents, and they visit her numbers. I, outnumber local residents by eight to one, apparently a higher ratio than Barcelona and London. This is Porto in, in Portugal. Okay? She goes on to say, Lourdes Magallanes no longer sees her neighbors. She only sees tourists. The neighborhood chatters replaced by the sound of suitcase wheels on the cobblestones. And I thought, has anyone captured these disappearances, absences, presences, which can be replicated across Europe and the globe? The, go the photograph of a gold beach, I think, that I showed you before, highlights um, this trend where people go and spend six months there and uh, get their teeth done or whatever it is they want to do because they can get it cheaply. Um, they don't have to pay their fuel bills in Britain or in Russia over the winter. And I wonder if they give a thought to, the, to, to how the local people feel there. So, um, belonging and attachment to, to a place, uh, it's always changing, it's dynamic. It embodies tangible changes and non-tangible changes. You know, it's difficult to sometimes describe these feelings of attachment to a place. We cannot understand migration and how it affects a community if we do not take into account and go back to looking at everybody who lives there. I mean, I think a very good example is the way in which we house refugees in so-called um, um, hard-to-let council houses. And then we worry about why people there are anti anti antagonistic towards them. You know, have you ever thought of actually engaging with the local people and sort of telling them what we're planning to do before we have people come into those communities? I think there are, and you know, this has been proven time and time again, and yet we keep replicating it. How has research helped to move us on? I, I cannot see it sometimes. What are we doing by pro proliferating all this research? We can't even change that dynamic of refugee settlement. Migration scholarship faces many challenges and opportunities, um, you know, which is amplified by the wider processes and dyna dynamics not easily visible or understood in the context of current frameworks and rarely discussed. As I, um, Sassen has another book, which she calls Expulsions. And uh, it's a, it, for me, it's, it's a wonderful book, because I keep going back to it. It tries to make sense of the complexity of the global economy and dynamic geographies, growing inequalities, displaced peoples, destruction of environment. So she explores different do domains, really sort of forensically. Uh, to quote, to quote her, to trace the lines of responsibility to the haze, which are manifested in diverse trends and experiences. And, you know, she looks at shrinking economies and the expulsion of the middle classes from labor markets in Greece, Spain, Portugal, in the light of the economic crisis, land grabs, the collapse of the finance and the subprime markets that led to thousands of people being expelled, being made homeless. The precarious lives of growing up with people across Europe and globally, where their rights to nourishing food, security, and so on are, are, are being eroded. These trends and manifestations are not the outcomes of specific individuals or organizations, or, or, but are part of what she calls a predatory logic, associated with what she calls larger assemblages of elements, conditions, and reinforcing conditions. And um, I know this is really long, but what she argues is that there are a mix of elites and systemic capacities with finance and key enabler that push towards acute concentration. What concerns me, she argues, is the extreme forms it takes in more and more domains across a good part of the world. Rich individuals of global formations by themselves could not have achieved such extreme concentration of the world's wealth. They need what we might think of systemic help, a complex interaction of these actors with systems re-geared towards enabling extreme concentration. Such systemic capacities are a variable mix 
of uh, technical market and financial information, innovations plus government en enablement. So it is quite complex. Once these capacities are part of the global commission, they do, she does not argue that we should, we should solely focus on such a, on such a abstract global, global wealth level. She says that we can only understand these global conditions, which are a haze, which are obscure, through specific countries, their laws, their political economies, and their governments into which citizens are incorporated or enticed. The formations that Sasson talks about are complex, subterranean, opaque, difficult to make visible based on our current categories of meaning making and conceptual frames of reference and ways of doing research within specific disciplinary boundaries and silos. Sasson and Feldman is acutely aware of the importance of analyzing the specifics of diverse local contexts, that is, the experience of a middle class person in Spain being ejected from the labor market is not the same as the experience of a small farm holder ejected from her land and having to migrate to an urban slum. They're not the same, but we do need to understand these together in some ways to pinpoint the similarities and the dynamics, the deeper dynamics that are driving it. Rather, in the context of, book, uh, of a book on expulsion, she argues that, that the rise in numbers of people, places, and enterprises being expelled from what she describes as the core economic and social orders of our time requires an investigation from the ground up which examines diverse examples in different national and local contexts to make them visible and to arrive at a better understanding of the dy diverse dy dynamics at play. Such an endeavor requires researchers to operate painstakingly from the ground level up within and across different binaries at what Sasson calls the systemic edge, where extreme expulsions and inclusions take place to systematically expose the commonalities and specificities of migrant and non-migrant experiences across and within different types of places and localities. This painstaking work does not chime well with the current research and academic regimes, where success is measured by rapid research and by how many journals one can churn out quickly for one research project before it is even concluded. I know I review a lot of papers clearly when the research hasn't been done because everybody is under pressure to get papers out. And in fact, the same research might serve different theoretical causes um, or have different theoretical explanations. You have to wonder about the ethics of some of this work. Coming back and finally to the register, to Feldman's We Are All Migrants, what it, what it is meant to capture and draw attention to is the fact that whoever we are, we have essential preconditions for participating actively in any form of social life. As uh, um, Ian Goff, in a recent book in 2017, argued, for, it's, it's a book called Eat, Greed, and Human Need, where he tries to link the whole issue around humans and the relationship with the environment. And I think it's an interesting sort of book to, to dig into. These preconditions involve meeting basic needs, including, for example, access to water, food, shelter, health, non-hazardous work and living conditions, physical and economic security, and so on. However, our slogans of our common humanity and seeing migration, and seeing migration in individual terms will not do as Sassin attempts to demonstrate in expulsions. It is essential to acknowledge and address the fact that access to satisfying these needs is differentially distributed and not equally available to everyone within nation states and between nation states. Within this context, making visible differential access to power and hierarchies as they intersect with class, race, ethnicity, gender, and so on in specific situations is also fundamental to moving the debates forward in a way that addresses the complexities of human lives, where, where, whereas um, where, as individuals, we might be power holders as well as powerless. Just depends on them. None of us are absolutely powerless. We, we, they have power in some contexts and not have power in others. We need to understand that. 
Also, this, this also requires researchers to move beyond the disciplinary boundaries and, and normative frames of reference with, with regard to how we create knowledge and ownership and doing the research too. Boundaries, lines, binaries that divide us also has the, and divide and provide reductionist arguments, if you like, also have the potential as liminal spaces, edges, to challenge, experiment, trans and transform normative ways of thinking, understanding, and doing research on migration beyond simplistic, dualistic, and reductionist discourses. And that's where I end, and thank you very much. And, um, thank you. because there's a whole lot of literature um, at the moment which uh, uh, comes under the title of trans-local, trans-local, so where people have looked at the connections between one local area and another. Um, it, it's, it's particularly common in rural studies where there's been a whole lot of focus on trans-locality, you know, and there's a debate about whether it's rural to rural, but it can be rural to urban. Um, and people, I know that some work has been done around networks of businesses, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and networks. But um, there, there is, um, certainly I know that I'm exploring with uh, one of the things that the Belinda and I are doing is we're, uh, we, we sort of, it took us a, a year really to conduct a, a, an exercise which we, where we looked at trans rural, the way in which local communities um, the, the research, particularly using migration as a lens to look at what the research has done, and there is some work being done, uh, but not a lot of work, and it's very difficult. Sometimes people use secondary data to, 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 to focus on it. Um, there is some work that geographers have done, which have looked at emotional aspects of those kind of local links as well. Um, uh, academic based at the University of Kiel, for example, has a, a special journal article. So, so what we're doing is quite uncharted territory. Um, we are uh, just about to, uh, in the next semester, probably from next year, start a piece, a pilot piece of work, which is an, um, which will be non Ontario and one, one will be in the Highlands, where we have, um, we're going to be using a biographical approach, um, a life history approach to look at it. And so it's very experimental, I would say. So I, I can't say whether it works, what the challenges. I can see lots of challenges. It's how do you, how do you define them? Because what we're doing is we're looking at, we're not looking at international, national, either. We're, we're looking at all forms of different types of migration. We're doing a pilot, so it's going to have to be very small. So, uh, but the whole idea is to look at, the, um, to explore theory generation, because we don't find what's available. Helpful to us at the moment, and that's the idea of the So I'll tell you about it in about 18 months. Maybe. Yes. Thank you, Philomena, for a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, and it's very useful that you, you frame your analysis in socioeconomic processes driving these movements. Um, however, can I ask do you think that there's an element of the academic discourse reflecting? the first world dominance of the South. Um, in other words, what we give priority to in the debate, uh, this issue of uh, 
concern over categorizations, false binaries, essentialism, anti-essentialism, uh, when rightly you, you state there that the flow from the south to the north is only a subsection, or a portion, a small proportion of the general flows in the world. The, the main issue really is, and this is borne out in Mike Davis's work, The Planet of the Slums, is the steady flow of population from rural areas because of depressed agricultural prices and then upward inflation of land prices in cities, driving people into slums. Probably it would be more useful if some of the academic discourses discussed where the main proportions of the flows are and it would be more beneficial in alleviating the suffering of humanity as well. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this, um, one of the things that Sassen does is look at historical, um, you know, she looks at different periods of migration, one of her books, Destiny and Aliens. And what she says is that the countries that were immigrant um, uh, receiving countries continue to maintain the advantage in the system that exists. You know, just, uh, you know, and although, I mean, take it in the context of the EU is a very good example where you know, it's all based on free movement of labor, capital, or whatever, goods and services. And the whole idea was open the market to the East and Central Europeans and, you know, it'll all equalize and, you know, there'll be a lovely flow of movement and Northerners will move to, to the East. And of course, that type that hasn't happened. I mean, you look at Spain and what happened, you know, how many years did it, it was mainly an immigration country for a few years, it's, it's, it's you know, almost gone back. So, I mean, there's an interesting dynamic there. So, no, I, 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 I agree with you, but I, you know, I, I suppose as someone who works in migration where I see, I don't know, there must be thousands of articles that they publish published, I mean, it's sort of, I just think, you know, what is happening here? Why are we proliferating this research? And I, for me, I have to just literally start standing back. And I don't think I'm anywhere near thinking, well, this is it, or this is the right solution, or whatever. It's just experimenting with different ways of thinking and trying to sort of come to some, feel better about some of the research I've done myself, which has promoted some of this too. Because we all have to get funny. Thank you, for I think that's the first time I've ever gone to one of your lectures. So, introduction. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, you're talking about this idea of um, we're all migrants, right? Um, and I suppose it's interesting to think about sort of people moving to the city versus people moving to the country, because in some ways, you know, when you're moving to the city, thinking about how you might be a migrant different because you don't actually feel out of place because everybody is often coming from different places and communities aren't so fixed or or there isn't even much a sense of community in certain places. Whereas obviously when you move to the countryside, at least in certain areas, that's where you can notice the community context in some places. Um, so I just wonder what it means to, to kind of like <coughs> that idea of we're all migrants or what, what is it? Or like what is is that showing solidarity? Like, what is what is what is this idea? What is it doing? What's the, what do you see it as? Well, I suppose for me, um, the, the the whole I, I think a lot of people are beginning to question how they do their work, particularly in the context of the way in which, in everybody's mind, when we talk about the migrant, the international migrant is the one that is, comes out, and I think. I, I, and I don't think even uh, Feldman or Sassen or anybody who are arguing for it, um, for this notion of looking at the common conditions is to argue that we're all the same. It's, it's more, but it's to demonstrate that there are some systemic conditions that are, you know, that are beyond individuals that are driving some of these things and the invasions and so on. That It may really change the discourse because they're not invasions. These are structured, they're patterned, because they're based on particular things. I don't know if this is what you are what you're asking about. But, um, but, you know, when you talk about being in a city, you might not feel a migrant. Um, I couldn't really quote this, but um, um, there's a, I, I had a serendipitous meeting with a, a wonderful woman on a train coming from Inverness to uh, Edinburgh to Inverness. 
and I had about half an hour of conversation with her. And she was one of these women that was very involved in the Henry George land rights movement. Wonderful woman. And I had this intensive conversation. And then she maintained um, some correspondence with me and said, shared some things with me that she published herself, and some of them were published uh, in, in different ways. And I, I've only had the time to go back and read some of the things she sent me. If you tell yourself that she died last year. She was in her 90s by then. And uh, she talks about being a young woman in, in Edinburgh going to London and how alien she felt. And I, you know, and I was just, I just started to read this book of her. She, she lived in Petrochery as I was writing this and I thought, uh, Shirley Ann Hardy is her name, you know, and I thought, I wish I could use that quote because it, it was just, um, <laughs> it was, um, it was, it just was so touching, you know, and so I'm not really sure, you know, that you, you can be lonely in a city and, and feel very isolated in a city as you can in and may not feel that in a remote audience. Do we have any questions uh, from people around the DC? No. Yes? Thank you, Philomena. I'm I, so rich and so full, everything that you shared, there is something impossible <laughs> for me to articulate my question, but, but there is something <clears throat> I do want to ask you, and I think it's uh, to do with this idea of how we become into our own understanding of being migrants. Uh, this, I, I find it a very cosmopolitan perspective, I suppose, to put a word on it, to start thinking of ourselves as people who are uh, historical beings, but also people who are part of a, a world. Um, and, uh, and it was very helpful to hear your own journey in that. And I suppose I wonder if that's a uh, a key for us in our research, because it's also been my experience in, in researching with people that I've started to understand my own uh, my own place as a person, um, and particularly this role of uh, remembering and forgetting story, uh, and all of our, our um, generations and genealogies of stories. That I'm thinking particularly in the context of the Highlands and Islands, where there is a long genealogy of of migration story, and also a long um, story of being instrumentalized in, in bigger systemic projects, the imperial project, and the idea of the exploitation of cultures and natures. And I wonder, I wonder why it is uh, that we, we forget the affect of those experiences. Um, I'm working and researching with people, particularly at the moment, who, to ask this question, you know, how do we find pasts uh, that are usable for understanding how to live and sustain in the world uh, now and in the future? Yeah. No, I absolutely uh, agree with you. I mean, I think that, you know, I had a couple of images here, and one of them was, I was really astounded when I, uh, to see this um, sculptures, these um, statues in Helmsdale to the immigrants, you know, which... Uh, was fine, you know, because it had uh, something about the sad loss of people leaving the landscape. And then it had something about went into the world and created big cities. And I looked at it. I was so shocked. I thought, how could somebody actually do that? You know, they could have just stopped and said, we feel sorry for the people that have. Perhaps when I look at the, the Highland landscape, I might see, of course I see the loss of people from the landscape, but I also feel the loss of the landscapes and the peoples that were devastated by people moving from here. And I felt it was such a good opportunity to address both sides of it. I mean, you can't read it, but if you ever go to Helmsdale, go and look at it. And I was just like, no, oh, this can't have happened in 2000 and whatever. That is utterly devastating. I felt devastated by it because I thought, my goodness, after all the stuff that, you know, we talk about, historians talk about, we have not got to understanding that we don't, we can acknowledge our suffering, but we can. Why doesn't it make us empathetic to what else we've done? It's, you know, 
it just felt um, shocking to me. And that the other photograph I had was of, um, I mean, I don't know, I put those two together. They came into, uh, this was, I was in Alabama last year teaching at uh, Tuskegee, which is uh, an African um, university, one of the first to be set up in the U.S. as a land grant university a site of terrible things, but Montgomery had um, a, a museum of peace and justice. In fact, the informal name was called the Museum of um, lynch, Lynching, you know, and had these amazing sculptures around the place. And it's just, uh, you know, I have to admit, I was in tears. It was just so, so powerful. And, you know, all of these histories are tied together in different ways, you know, and I'm not saying you can equate these things. You can't equate slavery with, uh, you know, these are, it's not about comparing them, but it's about understanding the human condition. And I so want that to happen. And, you know, I'll, I'll be interested in connecting up with you because that's partly why we decided to. We thought, you know, by looking at, by separating our internal migrants from international migrants, we are constantly reinforcing these divisions ourselves. What are their dynamics? What are their, what are the things that drive people, even if they move from here to there, you know, or have stayed in the same place? What is it that make, you know, makes people feel the way they do? And I, I, and I suppose I'm lucky enough that funding wasn't, was something that was uh, not tied to any particular <coughs> research project, so I can use it in the way I want it to be used, which is a I think the, the thing probably that you, you've made me ponder most in, in your talk is, is my, own, under, my own understanding of what pegmen actually means. What you said about the EU and then difference, uh, the fact that it's a colonizing or colonial or near colonial force is actually quite, quite an horrific realization for me. That it's the, the notion of land grab, but to formalize it through supposedly altruistic. Means is actually quite shocking and, and, and actually appalling. And so I think you know, what you're talking about in terms of sort of, what you just mentioned about the sculptures and so on sits uniquely within that context on a much more human scale. But I'm not thinking of my own evaluation of it in a completely and utterly different way. Yeah. Rather than a question. Um, yes, um, question about migration uh, in response to climate change. So is it the race we're failing to also address uh, climate change meaningfully either we're not able or willing. Um, so, I mean, the prediction would be one of perhaps mass migration, uh, either locally or even internationally. And I just wonder what research, if any, has been done in that area. People keep saying that there needs to be research on it, but it's not something that's <laughs> extensively been researched. It's another area that, you know, uh, because... Um, Particularly, I think, because people are really obsessed with uh, demo demographic trends and, and uh, worrying about existential, their, their own existential sort of uh, lives, I suppose, in some ways. And how do we, you know, it's, that's what I, I found myself getting really bored with, is constant focus on demography and uh, you know trying to increase populations and get labor skills from here there and everywhere and of course not really thinking about what are the ethics of this anyway you know i mean so other people invest in their education and we and um, some other country benefits from it is that okay you know uh, maybe as one gets older or whatever one has the luxury of asking these questions i've always asked them i have to admit but Sometimes uh, one has had to play the game. Okay, final question. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say congratulations uh, to the former life. I was uh, the, the Highland Councillor for Northwest and Central Cumberland, which, if you just say something, people think emptiness. But you were kind enough to invite Highland Councillors to come along to the lecture. From this, the Centre for uh, Remote Rural Studies. Oh, yes. And I'd just like you to thank you for that because if there are no other former councillors there, you have one and you have engendered in me enough um, get up and go to 
Uh, recently, I went to Tromsø to see what the northern sparsely populated area network were doing, and uh, I just wish that we had the ability to, or the funding, as you mentioned, to be able to join with them, because you're talking of very rich countries, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, still have issues yeah. with rural to to. Uh, okay. yeah. no, was, was it at the Highland Culture? No. Was it a, a seminar on the Highland Culture? So. Well, there were many seminars. Yes, I know. I do know. There were many, many seminars. <laughs> yeah. Especially, yeah. especially the ones for uh, older adults to look after older adults. So thank you for that. I was yeah. doing that too. So. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure. Elena will be around in a little while and if you have some further questions, you can perhaps catch your better directed. I'll pass over to Chris. I think that that was, I think that was just, we still provoke I still can't quite get over how angry I know I'm different, so I'm take that away. suggest that become a professor is more importantly seen as a celebration of that individual and the work by the peers, the university, and the wider field. It's a recognition not only of their work, but of, the, of their voice and of a voice that should be heard, and a celebration of a voice that others should converse with for the purposes of better understanding and improving the world we live in. A few things that Philomena has already touched upon very eloquently. This is a critical aspect of being a professor any particular discipline, because whether a professor is an expert in health science, social sciences, art, archaeology, equalities, or whatever the field might be, the concern is ultimately about advancing knowledge and making society and the world a better place to be now and into the future. Depending on our areas of expertise, being a professor will often also involve meeting others in challenging and confronting injustice and inequality and the rights and conditions of those who are disadvantaged or disenfranchised. And if, if in the work, we see very many powerful examples in this area. I did mention that being a professor is not just about professing, not just about talking and writing. Leadership is important, working alongside others, supporting the development of our colleagues as academics, as educators, and as researchers. 
as well as working in collaboration with the wider public to create and make knowledge accessible to all. To quote Alex Dunedin, the critical community educator, knowledge is power, but only when it's shared. The appointment of Philomena as a professor of the university is a recognition and celebration of all she's achieved, and also a means through which her already strong voice can carry further and be heard louder, and through which she can continue to share her knowledge and cover others. We welcome Nita, it is vital and it's vitally important. And on behalf of the university, it's a great honor to welcome Professor Philomena Lima, the Professoriate of the University of the Highlands.